So good evening, everyone. My name is Jason Walsh, and I'm here with Phoenix React.js tonight to talk about GraphQL and Relay. If you need the slides, you can find it in the bit.ly link at the bottom or on the Meetup comments. A little bit about myself. I've been doing development for six years now. The last three years, I've been working with Node.js and React. So we started out with Node version 0.10, I think. I'm now director of engineering at a company called Consolidated Knowledge, which specializes in real estate software solutions. And I also have a side company, Walsh Web, which I had started last year. And I have a lot of small and medium-sized clients that I work with. I also do a lot of hiking and backpacking. So my dream is having that remote digital nomad job where I can be on top of a mountain directing. But that might not work out for me. Here are a few of my badges of honor. So I've been to a lot of like hackathons and conferences in the last year or two. So it's <coughs> like my little collection of secret currency that is worth nothing. And a little bit about consolidated knowledge. So we have two different tech stacks. We're working with React and Node.js. And we have a happy web server that's backing our Node.js app. We also work with Elm, Phoenix, and Elixir. And those are kind of technologies that are a little bit newer to get adopted. So we are currently testing out both of those and seeing out which is going to work best for us. One is more functional, and one is kind of tried and true based on the team that we have. We also use Postgres, which is our back-end data store. And we've got about 15 people in our IT department right now. We also have a few open source projects. So if anyone's interested in like getting started with React or Node, uh, specifically with React, we have a React Webpack skeleton. So it's kind of an alternative to a bootstrap um, CSS if you're interested in having something a little bit different. And then we also have the Node Happy skeleton a little bit further down. And that's if you want to get a Node app up and running really quickly. We've got really good documentation on that as well. We've also provided some training for Elm and a little bit with uh, JS and React specific code. So today's talk. What is GraphQL? What is Relay? How does Relay relate to GraphQL and React? And then what is the ease of migrating to Relay? So this isn't a starter app that you have 10 JSON records that you're working with that you've just downloaded off the internet just to see how it works. This is us trying to migrate to Relay and our success and failures with it, and some of the errors we've gotten away, some of the complications, to give everybody a better idea of if it's going to be the right business move for their organization to start migrating over to Relay. And then at the end, we'll have kind of a post-mortem of what we learned, and we can open it up for questions. I also wanted to document here some of the libraries that we were using. So it's August 2016. So if you're watching this video a few years in the future, this is kind of what we were working with at the time. So let's look at current adoption right now. We have a lot of Flux architectures that are out there that is the data networking layer between React applications and your back-end web servers. So we've got Redux at 208. Uh, 100,000 downloads per week. And then Flux, the library that was created by Facebook, is at 49,000. We've got GraphQL at 19,000. And then if you look at the bottom, there's Relay with 7,000. And it seems really strange that GraphQL and Relay have different numbers. And we can explore that a little bit later. So show of hands, I'm currently using Relay and GraphQL in production. We have one almost. I've played with Relay and GraphQL with a starter app. Three, four developers. I haven't tried Relay and GraphQL, but I've heard of it. Almost everybody. Except me. It's a first time I've heard about it. OK. There's a few people who haven't heard of this. OK. And I'm just here for the Chipotle. <laughs> You're going to have a bad time. <laughs> well, unless you ate the Chipotle, and then you can leave early. Uh, so what is GraphQL? It's a query language created by Facebook in 2012, and it was open sourced last year. And it's built for describing data requirements on complex application data models. So what does that mean? It's an alternative to REST. It receives a GraphQL query, and you can request a record or collections, or multiple records, essentially. And you can give it filters. You can request which fields you want. And you can also specify mutations or how to change your data. So these would be like the creates, updates, and deletes. 
Why use GraphQL? You're declaring exactly what data you need if you start using GraphQL queries. So you're not underfetching data or overfetching data. And we'll look at an example of that in a second. You're also not managing multiple versions of REST. So you don't have like a V1 users, V2 users. You just have an endpoint where your developers can request exactly what they need. You can optionally request child data. So if you've got, say, a feed and you've got users that are on that feed, you can just say, I want this feed and get me all the users that are attached to it. And it makes it really simple. And you can also validate the input that comes in from your mutations. So if you've ever worked with web servers before, you always want to validate your data. And mutations have some of that built in already. Also, one other note is with mutations, you always get intentional output. So who here has worked with node servers before? OK, a lot of developers. And so you've probably worked with promise chains, uh, either, either that or async await. But if you've worked with promise chains, you have to make sure that the result of the saved object or deleted object or updated object gets traveling through all of those promise chains front end again. And so if another developer comes in and changes that endpoint, you can sometimes have issues. So here's an example of REST versus GraphQL. We're on the user detail page, and we just want the first name, city, and ID. Here's a simple REST endpoint. So we're getting users, getting the first uh, user with ID of one. And we get back a lot of information about that user, along with their roles, photos, hobbies, and a whole bunch of other information. And coming from working uh, in a Node application environment for the last three years, we have a lot of REST endpoints that do this, where they overfetch a ton of data just because it's really simple and we don't have to worry about it. But the users suffer at the end of the day. So what are our options here if we don't want to overfetch data with a REST endpoint? We can pass in some indicators of which, which fields we want. So we can say, like, just get me small fields or medium-sized fields or whatever. You can create a new endpoint, but that's anti-REST. You could look at things like referring URL, but that feels a little bit hacky. Or you could just overfetch the data, which is what we've always done in the past. And so here's a sample GraphQL request. I want a user with ID of one, and I want the fields ID, first name, and city. And I get back exactly that. So let's write some code. And there's going to be a lot of code examples here. So if you're having trouble seeing the slides in the back, it might be a good idea to download the slides and, or share with a laptop of someone next to you. Jason, I'm sorry. This assumes you, you have a no GS server in the background, right? Correct. Yep. And Jason, can you, can you please repeat the questions as they come up? Yeah, so the question was, if I had a Node.js server that I'm going to be working with, and the answer is yes. Since a lot of developers are going to be familiar with React and JavaScript, I figured that this would be the best backend server to implement on. And there's a few consolidated knowledge-specific libraries that I'll be talking about tonight. They're not important, but you'll see them in the code. So Connex is our SQL query builder. So when you say select star from x and then run the query against the database, we use Connex for that. We've got Bookshelf, which is our ORM on top of Connex. And that handles getting either one model back or a collection of models. It handles camel casing versus snake casing for us when we get input into the, uh, for fetching records, and then when we get de records out of the uh, database. And it will return our data in a very consistent way. So anytime we do a search on a collection, we always get back the records as an array and count as some integer. And then we've got our happy web framework, and that's just uh, for defining some of the routes that we'll use for GraphQL. So we've got a GraphQL type system, and there's a few pieces of this that I'm going to talk about tonight and a few that I'll skip over. So we're going to look at scalar types, object types, the interface type, and also GraphQL lists. And on the right, we've got our standard int, float, string, boolean, and there's an ID field to indicate that it's a unique ID. So schema.js, we're going to write our first custom GraphQL object type. So we're going to be working with, in this example, audit log. We give it a name of audit log. And then we define the fields that we want the user to be able to request from our GraphQL endpoint. So we've got an ID, which is a GraphQL ID, and a note, which is a type of GraphQL string. Is it lambda expression that we fields? This is lambda expression fields? Yeah. So the question was, is this lambda expression? This is ES6 syntax. So it's a different way of writing functions. But essentially, whenever you see this, it's just got the function declaration on the left, and it has a specific binding to it. Yeah. So this came from C sharp to JavaScript. Uh, I don't think that it's related to Lambda functions. 
Yeah, it's a shortcut for saying this is a function, and then I'm returning an object from that function. So we've defined our audit log object type, and now we need to add it to what's called a query type or root type. There's a lot of different terminology out there uh, in the example apps, but it looks a little bit like this. So we've got a GraphQL object type, which is going to be the final one that we're going to be exporting. And we're giving it the name query here. Some people call it root. I actually renamed it to root in the later examples, so I'm sorry for any confusion related to that. And we've got the fields object, and this is going to be all of our custom GraphQL objects that the user can search on. So in this case, I've got audit log and audit logs, a record and a collection set. We've got args, and args in this case is going to be what the user is allowed to search with or filter with. So in this case, with the audit log, I can search on ID only and no other fields that are in that database table. We've got resolve functions. And here you can return a promise. I actually have it returning callbacks that return a promise because it was just an example I pulled early on. But you can return a promise that says, fetch your records from the database and then return them through GraphQL. And any of the fields that I return are going to get stripped through the fields that are allowed to be returned. And then we give that back to the user. So let's take a look at some examples. Uh, and before we do that, we have a GraphQL route, so it's just slash GraphQL. I'm doing a get request right here, and I'm hard coding audit logs. So I want to get back all audit logs in my database, and I want the ID field, and I want a note field. And here's a request to slash GraphQL. It's a get, and I get a 200 back. And you can see I have a data key, and then there's an object returned. And inside that, there's a key of audit logs that has the array of all of the collection um, records that I had requested with ID and note. As expected, if we just request audit log with an ID of seven, we get back that one record. If I ask for audit log with ID of seven and just request for the ID field, I just get back the ID field. And quick note on this, it's still possible for your SQL queries to do over fetching. So it's still actually requesting ID and note from the database here, but it's stripping it out as it returns that GraphQL response. So that could be something to keep in mind. And then here I'm making a request for ID 99999, and I get back empty response, which is a connects error. So this is kind of what errors look like. You never get back a thrown error, but you'll have an array of errors that come back in GraphQL. Will that still be a 200 response or be a 404? It'll still be a 200 response. So next steps. I'm going to finish creating all my GraphQL objects and lists for our database schema. And then everything is going great until I start defining a GraphQL object called exception report. And what this does is it stores information about things that might have went wrong on the server. It's got an ID, a name, a description, and a metadata field, which in Postgres is a JSONB field. Um, and I c developers can store anything they want in the metadata field. So we actually don't even know what the keys are here. We'll just use the GraphQL any type. Wait, there isn't one. So how do we handle this? Defining objects when you don't know the keys. Stack Overflow said, well, you don't really want to do that. But if you do have JSONB objects or you're working with NoSQL, you can stringify the objects. And then you'll get them sent as a string to the front end where you would need to decode them. But like I said, I recommend you don't. Darn. So if you work with NoSQL data, or if you have uh, stored API responses or webhook responses from third-party vendors, and you want to put those into GraphQL, that might be something to think about, that it could be a challenge for you. So I've mapped all my objects and lists. We had 15 different collections that I was working with, so it didn't take a lot of time, except for the JSONB issue. This was actually a pretty smooth process. We're going to start looking at Relay. Um, and so. GraphQL, I haven't shown you any GraphQL mutations yet, but we'll also get to that a little bit later. So Relay, it's designed to work in parallel with React as the data fetching layer. You can co-locate the data next to your component. So if I've got a React component that's a notes component, I can see what I'm requesting from that notes component and how many records and which records. It's all on the same page, so it's very easy to 
co-locate the data and understand what's going on. Because you're not using read at all? Correct. Okay. You can easily modify the data from the same view. So if you decide you need this new field like created by, which is going to be a user ID, you can request that immediately and then you'll get it back without having to make changes to any endpoints. You can optimize, uh, really optimize this data fetching on the caching layer. So I'll show you what I mean by that a little bit later, but it does some magic, which is pretty neat. And your mutations can offer some data consistency, so you define what input goes in and what input comes out. It also handles optimistic responses, and it does some error handling as well. So I've installed React Relay. React Router Relay. So if you use React Router, this is kind of, it gives you the capability of passing your relay queries up very easily, but that might be optional for you. And Babel Relay Plugin. So why do we need Babel? I was a little bit surprised to see that there was a Babel Relay Plugin at first, but then I realized that all of Relay's um, fragments that you're going to be specifying right below your components are called tag template strings. So it's using that backtick. It's kind of like when you have the strings that are on new lines in JavaScript. But if you have a function right before that uh, template, then it's called a tagged template. And it does some transpiling in the Babel Relay plugin. So you can either do that by, you can, Babel Relay plugin requires that you get schema.json from that schema.js file we were just working in. And you can do that by loading uh, schema.json on the front end through the file system. Or you can make a network request to get GraphQL's introspection query, which basically just returns the schema.json. So if you have a separate front end and back end app, you might need to make that network request to make this work for you. Let's take a look at the network request. On the left, I've got a Babel RC file, which says, use this Babel Relay plugin. And then inside the Babel Relay plugin, I'm using a library called sync request. So this is not a promise. It just waits for the response here. And I'm making the request to my local backend web server um, at the schema endpoint. And then it's going to give me back that schema.json file that I need. And I can send that into the Babel Relay plugin so that it can start using introspection on the front end. Here's the endpoint in Happy. And GraphQL, the library, makes it so easy to access introspection. You just import it from GraphQL slash utilities and then you can return it to the front end. And here's a sample introspection response, which shows what it's doing behind the scenes. You can also request schema.json via the file system. So if you're building it on the fly and your front end can access it, that's the better way to go. And all you need to do in your Babel Relay plugin is require that schema.json file and then return it. And here's a sample of generating schema.json. It's not really uh, too fancy. You're just writing to the file system whenever your schema changes through the introspection query, which we imported a few minutes prior. When do you do that? You can do it uh, whenever you want. So you can do it whenever your schema.json file changes. Sorry, schema.js file changes. You can do it via a make command right before build time when you're doing a deploy. Um, you could use Nodemon to watch for changes on that and have it build on the fly. So it's really up to the developer. Uh, I had it so that any time I started my backend web server that it would build, but maybe that's not optimized for your experience. So it's a migration concern. But you, you just do it whenever your schema changes. Correct, yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah. The question was, is it a migration concern, and should we just do it whenever the schema changes? And that's correct. So Relay, here's the getting started instructions from their website. And I noticed after implementing all my GraphQL schema that there's a documented GraphQL Relay specification. Huh, what's that? <laughs> there's three core assumptions that Relay makes about a GraphQL server. And it is that you can refetch an object. You can create connections or relationships between all of your collections. And there's a predictable structure around mutations. Sounds easy. So let's get started. I need to make a few changes to my schema.js file. I need to refactor my individual custom GraphQL objects so that they start using Relay's global ID 
and refetch concept, and we'll talk more about that in a second, I'm starting to change my GraphQL lists into connections, which is a special data type that gets returned from the GraphQL relay library, and we'll talk about that next. I start adding mutations per the spec, and I also do filtering on my collections and children collections so that the user still has that same filtering experience that they already had, but that's not part of the spec. But I'll show you what we did with that anyway. So I wanted to install, at this point, GraphEQL. And if you've ever seen any presentations on GraphQL before, this is probably the user interface that you've looked at. It, has an, it uses GraphQL's introspection so that it can auto-complete on all of the queries and just tell you this is what it's available for your developers to use when you're creating your relay fragments. And with Happy, I just installed a plugin, and then I removed my GraphQL endpoint. And it's that simple. Also, Express has a plugin, and that was the first one to build the GraphEQL plugin that I know of. So GraphEQL, as a keyboard shortcut, I can just say Control Space to autocomplete and see all of the uh, objects and lists that are available for me as a developer to access. Here's a sample request. So I'm requesting note with a row ID of two. Previously, we were using ID, but we'll talk about that global ID field and how it changes your data in a minute. And I wanted to get back the fields of ID, row ID, and note, and I did. And we'll talk about that node field below a little bit later. So refetching via node root field. TLDR, if I have a note object with a row ID of two, and it implements the node interface, which is part of the spec, it will give me a, an ID, a global ID, of something that's base64 encoded. And then when I make a GraphQL query of node with the ID of that base64 encoded string, it should return the note object with a row ID of two. It sounds convoluted, but they use this in their like, front-end caching to optimize your queries a lot. So it makes sense from the relay perspective, even though they start hijacking your ID field, which is probably your primary key on every table. So we had a GraphQL object before that we were creating, like audit log. And how does it change? We're changing ID to use the global ID field. And then at the bottom, we have interfaces. And we're specifying that we want to use a node interface. So a global ID field. There's an open issue about this on the Relay um, GitHub page about renaming ID to underscore underscore ID so that they're not hijacking your ID field, which is probably used for your primary keys. Um, they're planning on integrating this concept, but it's not ready yet. And there are forks that are currently being supported by a user named Alloy on GitHub where it's already using underscore underscore ID if you're interested in using those. CK just decided to throw in the towel and use row ID instead. So you install GraphQL Relay, which is this new library that's going to help us with implementing the spec. And they give us this node definitions function that you can import. And what it does at, is you pass in two functions. The first function is, given a global ID, how do I fetch my first object or the object that matches that global ID? And then the second function, called the type resolver function, is given the object that comes back from the database how do I then know what GraphQL type it is? So the first function is we're fetching an object. And then the second function is we're saying, here's the object. Now tell me what GraphQL object type it is. The problem is, when you get back a record, how are you going to tell what GraphQL object type it is if that's the only data that you have? Let's take a look at how GraphQL answered that question. So from the website, I don't have the global ID anymore, just the record. And here is a sample implementation. If object has own property username, it must be a person. So the recommendation in the example is to start looking at attributes to tell if you can create a, which type of GraphQL object it's going to be. The object to type name resolver above is no marvel of engineering, but you get the idea. So how do we actually do it? Because that doesn't sound like a very good idea. And also, by the way, um, currently, I think the example is wrong because it returns a string of person. And you actually need to re return a GraphQL type here. So I took the node definitions function that I was importing, and I rewrote it. At the very bottom, there's a comment that says, add global ID here to access it in the type resolve function. So I'm taking my record that I get back that I just fetched from the database, 
I'm injecting a do, uh, an underscore underscore ID record into it, which is the global ID, and then I'm returning that record. Now, when I get the results back from GraphQL, remember we specified all of the fields that are allowed to be returned, and underscore underscore ID is not one of them, so it immediately gets stripped out, but it's still accessible during that type resolve function. And this is what it really looks like. I do my fetch object by type and ID, so I get back my audit log record here, or my note record. And then I get the record back, and I can call from global ID with record dot underscore underscore ID. And that will give me back the type of audit log or note or person. And then I can use a switch statement to say, if this is a string of person, give me back the person object in GraphQL. It's much easier. And previously, we had the root or query object, where we had all of our GraphQL objects that were available to the user. And that was the last thing we exported in schema.json, or .js, sorry. And now we need to add a node field to that. And there it is. And node is returning a node field, which only accepts your global ID as the uh, field that can be returned from it. So we'll take a look at an example of this in one second. And it also just resolves with an empty object. And it seems, sorry, I'm disregard that. The root field is going to come a little bit later. But we, are, we have a node key that's going to implement the node field, which got returned from the function two slides prior. So here's node field that gets returned from this build interface function. So let's take a look at an example. Hey, Jason. Yes, sir. A little bit lost here. So you can you define your own custom types. And like a type is going to be, since you can roll so many pieces of data into, like you can have a kind of an arbitrary looking, an arbitrarily nested object, you're, you're saying that you somehow have to like give that thing a name, right? So you can Correct. A user, but a user might have roles and other things inside of it. It might even have almost some metadata on the outside, but you are responsible for like what is with the thing and does that match with Yeah, a little bit. The question is, um, how do we define our GraphQL objects, and how does that correspond with us giving it a string name, and how does that work with the global ID field? So in this example, we have an audit log, which is going to be returning an audit log type. And the string that we pass in is audit logs, because it's going to be handling the record and the collection. And we haven't looked at collections uh, as implemented by Relay yet. But what will happen is, when we get a response back from GraphQL, we're also going to be returning the global ID, which is a base64 encoded string. It's basically just audit logs, colon, and then the ID name. And so then when Relay makes optimized queries on the front end using that global ID field, they're going to pass that base64 encoded string back up. And then using this new node field here, we're going to, no matter what it is, they're going to just say, here's a base64 encoded string that's some node, and I want to get that node back from the database. But they don't, need to, they don't really want to know what the query is. They just want it to be resolved automatically by decoding that global ID field. So you get back your type again, and you get back your record ID or your row ID. Does that help answer the question? You refetch all your dependent back global ID? Correct. You never have to like, figure out which primary key it's entering? Correct, because that'll be encoded in that base64 encoded string. So in the previous slide, I was using a function called root field by ID. Basically, what this says is, if we do pass in a global ID, then use the global ID, decode it, and find out what my row ID is. But also, I can use a row ID and, uh, and specify what the object type is. And then I can just do a fetch on that directly. So you can choose to use the node here, or you can choose to use your record type and then the row ID. I don't know if it's a best practice. I looked at so many different code examples while I was implementing it that I can't remember exactly where I grabbed this from, but it's pretty convenient because on the front end, if I have like all of my feeds and then I want to get feed ID 5, I don't have to refactor that endpoint. I can just say, like, I know that this is a feed. I know I want ID 5. And then this root field by ID function will handle that for me. And then once it gets it back from GraphQL, it'll insert it into Relay. And then Relay has the global ID. So anytime it needs to refetch, it'll just use that global ID field. Yes, 
And let's test it works. So I'm asking for note with row ID of 1, and I get back that ID field, which is the global ID that's base64 encoded. And then I ask for node using that ID field that's base64 encoded. Red operator on the note type. And I can say, I know that this is, this is something that Relay does automatically, but just for purposes of having everybody see how it works behind the scenes, they say, OK, I figured out that it is a note because I can decode that from the base64 encoded string and see that's of type note. And I want back all of the fields that are related to the note that the user already asked for the first time it came back. So anytime they do a refetch, they know exactly what fields you need, what the type was, and the ID. And then they can get it back with the node very easily. Connections. A connection is, in essence, a collection of objects with metadata that's associated with it. So you get this page info metadata object, and it includes has next page, has previous page, start cursor, and end cursor. It has an array of records, and those records are called edges. And each edge, instead of it just being a record, it also has metadata associated with it. So it has a node, and that's all the fields that you requested. That's stored in the node. And there's a cursor, which is another base64 encoded string to help relay with pagination. It's separate from the global ID field, but they use it internally to help with pagination. Here's an example connection if I was going to be making a relay request. I'd ask for all notes, and then I could say, get me the page info, get me the edges or the records, and then get me the, for each node the ID, row ID, and note. And then I can also get the cursor of each record for pagination. So pagination works differently in Relay than what you've probably used before unless you've used cursors. I think a lot of people are going to be familiar with the limit and offset. Has anybody used cursors if you haven't implemented Relay for pagination? One person, two people, three people. OK. So with cursors, you'll ask for the first x records, the first 10 records, for instance. And then you'll get back those 10 records. And now we have a cursor that is going to be attached to those records. So the next time you want to make a paginated request, you'd say, get me the first 10 records after that cursor. <coughs> this is designed, was designed originally for the Facebook feed and infinite scroll. And it kind of moves away from back and, back and next buttons, as we'll take a look at in the future slides. So what about limit and offset? Why can't we just use that? And here's an example that's provided on their site about why you shouldn't use limit and offset. So I request the first 10 notes in my table of 20 notes. There they are. And then another user deletes note 4. So that's gone. And then as a user, I request the next 10 notes, and I don't get back note 11 because it falls into the first 10 at this point. So I only get back 12 through 20 in my table of 20 records, or 19 at this point. So note, 10, note 11 has fallen out, and it gets skipped while I'm paginating. Cursors. So I, recurse the first, I request the first 10 notes in my table of 20 notes, and I get back all of my notes with a cursor. And then I, another user will delete note 4. And then I request the first 10 notes after that cursor ID, and I get back 11 through 20. So how does page info work behind the scenes? Out of the box, GraphQL Relay's cursor is a base64 encoded string that's the word array connection, colon, and then the array index of the record that you got back from the database. So if you have 20 records, it's going to be 0 through 19. And the request is a fetch all function. So you ask for all records that come back in the database, and then you assign the cursor based on the array index. And this is how ne has next page is calculated. If total edges dot length is greater than the first x records, so like the first 10 records, I'll return true. So if I get back, if I have 100,000 records in my database, I'll request all 100,000 records, and then I'll say, is 100,000 greater than the first 10? Yes, so it has a next page. And then at the very end, it slices your edges, your 100,000 records, and it returns the amount specified in the first var. So it's like, OK, I have 100,000 records stored in memory, but they only want 10, so here's the 10 that you requested. <laughs>
So there's an open issue on GraphQL Relay on June 19th regarding the reality of fetch all on production databases with hundreds of thousands or millions of records. How do you handle it? It's basically assuming you're pulling back all the total records and you can't request just a portion of the records and then make another request to the next portion because the cursors could change in between. So you basically need to also cache all of the records that you get back from that fetch and then you need to handle cache invalidation at some point when your collection mutates. So here's one user's solution that is decently elegant. And he's saying, instead of doing a fetch all on all your records, do a fetch all on the first 10 records plus one. And then you can say, does this have a next page because it has an 11th record? And yes, it does. So then you can keep paginating. And you only over fetch by one here. So that's pretty neat. The problem is, this falls apart if you're not ordering by ID descending. If you start ordering by name, then the ID is not going to be a good cursor for you anymore. And part of the solution is you need a base64 encode your row IDs instead of array indexes. So when, once you stop ordering on that, it doesn't work for you anymore, and your cursors aren't in the right order. What are some other solutions? You can implement cursors at the data store level. So if you have a data store that supports this, then you can utilize that right away. So Postgres can do that. But if your stream ends, then your cursors can potentially change by the time you reopen that stream. You can use the value of the field being ordered instead of the ID. So for example, if I want to order by state, I could get store the cursor as base64 encoded state. So Arizona, Arizona, Arizona. But this will break down if you don't have values that are unique. So I'll request Arizona five times for the first five results, and the cursor is the same for all of them. And then you request the, next, the first five after that cursor, and it's like, I don't know what to do. You can use row number for Postgres, which is kind of an advanced query that you can do in Postgres. But your cursors can change on the next request. If something gets deleted, for instance, then you're running into the same situation as limit and offset. So what do you do? I don't know. Uh, I, what CK did was we decided to implement with the ID plus one, and it's not a good solution. Uh, so there's a lot of debate in the community about how to realistically handle this. And I was asking Matt, was it, earlier about how he handles it. And he's working with a smaller data set, so it's not an issue right now. But I think it's still a big open question about how do we handle cursors, and does it actually give us a lot of benefit over not using limit and offset. Question. Is the, is the back end like CrowdTrim you're using in Node, that's Facebook code, or is that something else So GraphQL by itself, the question was, is this Facebook code, or is this just GraphQL? And the original code that we were looking at with the GraphQL objects and lists is just GraphQL. And then once you start creating connections and nodes, that's when you start getting into the relay spec of GraphQL. So it's not required that you use this, but if you want to use Relay, then this is how they start tying in automatically from the front end and optimizing their queries. Good question. <coughs> Yep. So the question was, how does GraphQL interface with your database? And I mentioned earlier that we were using Bookshelf as our ORM for fetching records and collections. And our Bookshelf, I haven't talked about filters yet, but with Bookshelf, I can just say, get me uh, the first 10 audit logs, uh, limit 10 audit logs, offset 0, and then it'll return those back. I did start changing that so it can implement first and, first and after, and also before and last, which are the other two cursors that they give you for the pagination spec. Um, and then I am still always overfetching and just grabbing all of the fields. And then GraphQL says, OK, these are the fields the user actually requested, and strips those out. But I have to tell you, the GraphQL queries I make are so quick. Like I can make a ton of requests and ask for a ton of data, and I get it back in like 20 milliseconds. So it's actually pretty brilliant, even though there is a little bit of overfetching happening from that regard. <laughs>
not from GraphQL. Relay does a little bit of front-end caching, and we'll see that a little bit later. The other part of the pagination spec is that it's unidirectional. So remember, this is designed for the Facebook feed, an infinite scroll. So take a look at the spec. Let's say that I have 10,000 records that are notes, and I'm somewhere in the middle. If I request for the first 10 records after some cursor in the middle, the spec says to always return false for has previous page. So you can only go forward, and it'll only tell you that you have notes going forward and you have next pages. And it doesn't even care if you have a last page anymore. So if you're not using an infinite scroll app, then this is either something you're going to need to rewrite or it's something that you need to consider. And creating connections. So this is the part that is probably the most code intensive. Previously, we had GraphQL lists, and now we're changing those to connections. And so remember, a connection is going to have page info and edges, and your edge is going to have a node and a cursor. So here, there's a function we're importing from GraphQL Relay called connection definitions. And I'm passing in my GraphQL type name of like audit logs. And then I'm passing in the GraphQL type. So it's an audit log type. So that means I can get row ID, ID, and note. And then I can also request some additional filters that get returned, or fields that get returned. So in this case, in all of the examples I've seen, they always return total count just so you have that. So you know like I have 6,000 audit log records. It's not really used, but you can see it in GraphQL queries and GraphQL queries so that you can get kind of an idea of what data you're working with, I think. And then when you create the connection, and this is a giant function, so I apologize in advance, but we're going to walk through it. You get the connection definitions, which we just looked at, which is that connection type. And it says, here's my edges and here's my page info. This is where you get to specify any additional arguments that the user can filter on. So there's a, fun, uh, there's a function called connection args. And the, the user can search on first, after, before, and last. And what I'm using is Lodash's assign method to pass in additional arguments. And if we look at the line above that, the arguments that I'm letting them pass in are all of the arguments that were previously specified on my GraphQL object type. So in essence, if in an audit log I can search on that note, it's injecting that as a field that the user can search on inside the connection. Towards the inside the resolve function, we also have inject filters. And we get this parent. Sometimes it's blank and sometimes it's not. And that's the parent object. So let's say I have a feed of some sort, and it's ID of 5. And I'm asking for all notes on that feed. This is where we can say, I want to just get all notes for a uh, feed of ID 5. And you can inject those as additional filters that are going to get ran by your SQL query. And then I get objects by type. Sorry, I convert the cursor. So this is where I hacked the cursor. So instead of it having array length, I'm asking for the IDs. You get the objects by type. So I get all the records back that match the audit logs with feed ID of 5. And then there's get connection object, and that's the edges and the page info um, using the spread operator. So we're just getting all of the metadata that's associated with this collection. And lastly, the total count, which is the metadata that we said that we want to include, but we don't really use from a relay perspective. So this is what it looks like if you make a GraphQL request using the relay spec. I'm requesting all feeds, but just getting the first one. I'm asking for all of the edges or records back, so I should only have one feed here. I'm asking for inside that feed, I want all of the notes related to it, and there's no filters there, so I'm getting all notes back on that feed. And then inside the notes, I just want the ID back, which is actually the global ID in this case, along with the page info. So can it paginate through notes? Are there more notes associated with this feed? And the total count. Are there questions? I know that that. JSON, yep. It's not JSON. It's not because it's JSON, you have to do uh, something with comments, right? It, it looks like a snap token. Oh, you're right. On the left, it's like JSON without the values. Right. That's how they set up the GraphQL language. And it's pretty brilliant, I think. You just say, like, this is what I want. And it's like, here's what you got with the values back. So they use special syntax, right, for queries? Yes. Special yeah, so this is the GraphQL query language on the left. Yeah, so it's 
So we'll see where this gets implemented on the front end in a minute. But previously, we were talking about that Babel relay plugin that I needed to implement to transpile the tagged template strings. And this is a tagged template string that we would give to relay. And then it would say, OK, this is what I really want to get back from the database in the GraphQL language. Correct, on the right, yep. Other questions? Yes, sir. So I, the question was, how can I get one element from the array? How can I specify that? And we have all feeds, which is going to be a collection of records. And I just want the first one. So in this case, this is just one feed. And it's getting back all the notes inside the feed. But then with note connection, I can say, just get me the first note. So I can specify first feed and then first note. And it would still understand that, because both of these are connections. No, I'm talking about inside. Like, for example, the ID, the ID maybe that's the array, right? That. Yes. Yes, but that's not what he's asking. So you're asking, how do you get back in our in a, uh, array field essentially? Yeah. So you, I didn't talk about this or show any examples about this, but in the GraphQL data types, there's a GraphQL list, and you would say this is going to be a GraphQL list, and the data type that I'm going to get back inside that list is either a string or an object or another list. But I want only one. Um, I think at that point, you would try and create a connection for it. I, I don't know that you can query or filter your fields after you get filtered on your connection or your object. Yes, sir. Yep. Its own data, you know, uh, you may know where I'm going with this, but like, does Relay have a way of like batching together like multiple requests that multiple components may want to make? Yes, it does, and that's one of the really neat things about Relay is that through the Babel Relay plugin, it'll transpile all of the different fragments, which are multiple different queries we're going to run, and it sends those as one request to the back end. So it's a really powerful feature. And then you don't have to worry about, on your single page apps, having a loading indicator here and here and here while all of the data is being fetched to these different components in React. Isn't that kind of a nightmare, though? Because like, with traditional REST, you kind of know, like, oh, OK, I get this request for this one task from an end to represent the resource. I know exactly how to fetch that from the database. But when you have like complicated queries like this coming in, how do you know optimally like, how to fetch that from Postgres So behind the scenes, the way that it's set up, at least for my implementation, is that when I request all feeds with first one, it's just going to do like a select star from feeds limit one. And then if I have another query that's being ran on that same page that uh, is audit logs, it will request select all from audit logs, limit whatever, filter whatever. And then inside the notes connection, it'll say, OK, I got back my first feed. And now I want to get all the notes. So it'll say select all from the notes table where feed ID equals 5 or whatever it is. And then if I have any limit on that through the cursor pagination spec, I can say, get me the first 5, and it'll say limit 5. I guess one of the limitations on that same subject is that you're going to be doing those sequentially, where like, if you're making multiple parallel like, yeah. inject, like, SHR requests, those, things can, those queries can run in parallel, say, like, across land databases or across like, caches or whatever, and then those requests are coming back in parallel. Yes. Yeah, so one of the developers said, one of the developers said uh, do the, the SQL queries happen in parallel on the back end? The answer is yes. And then you can also make it so the Angular queries do that on the back end as well. So you can like batch them all together. But it's a little bit harder to do. So really kind of take, takes care of that for you. And it's a really nice feature. Yeah, the question was, how am I using Bookshelf to manage queries on the back end? And with Bookshelf, we've got basically either a record or a collection of records that will come back. And so we'll say, get me a new audit log collection 
uh, limit 10. And then that'll do the query automatically based on some parameters that we've already set up. So we might have soft deletes built into that model. So I can say, get me all from the audit log where deleted at is no limit 10. And it handles all of the filters that the user is passing in. Let me get back to you on that one. The question was, what did I find lacking in GraphQL that I would like to be implemented? Any other questions on connections before we move forward? So we're almost done with the spec. We've got refetch, we've got connections, and now we need to look at mutations. But before we do that, let's look at some relay code so we can get an idea of what's actually happening from the front end. The first thing you need to do in relay is inject your network layer. So this is just saying, where is my GraphQL endpoint? Pretty simple. Next, if you're using React Router, then you can specify a middleware that says use relay, and you also specify a relay store. So remember I mentioned that a relay does a little bit of caching for you, so this is kind of where your data is going to be stored at, and it has all the global IDs in here so that it can keep track of things, and when it needs to do a refetch, it'll know this is what this type is, and these are the fields that I need to request with it. And so I've got my first route, which is going to be slash feeds. The component, the React component is called feed list, and I'm passing in Queries equals default query. And that's not shown here, but we're going to look at that next. So what is default query? In GraphQL, remember, we've defined a lot of object types like audit log, note, um, feeds. You can't make those requests side by side in Relay using the Relay spec. So you have to say, I want a root query. And inside that, it's going to use a little bit of recursion to say, inside the root, now get me the audit log and the feeds and um, the notes. And there's an open issue about it. It's something that they want to fix, but when they open source this, they didn't really have that need for their development needs with the Facebook feed. So it's something that's just been hanging out there. So we're going to create what's called a root uh, GraphQL type. And it's just going to recursively say, I can access all of the other GraphQL object types that we've already declared. And some people call this a viewer. So if you're using sample code and you see viewer in there, it's the same thing as this root key that we've created here. So here's my relay fragment. I'm going to say, get me all feeds and the first x variables. So we can pass in a variable here. And then using initial variables above, we can specify any defaults we want. And then we can also do transformations on those, which I'll show in a later slide, to pass in whatever variables we need to um, get the data that we need on the front end. So we request all feeds, first 10, and then get us the records, get us for each record the row ID and the name of that feed. From the render rows function, we can say this.props.root.allfeeds.edges, and then we get back our node, which is our actual record that we care about. And then we can show the row ID and the name here. So it's pretty simple uh, once you make your fragment query. With pagination, I've got a button here that says, I want to request the first 20 records. So I had the first 10 previously. Now I want the first 20. And you use this.props.relay, which is injected into all of your components. And it has some helper functions on it. And in this case, we're using a helper function set variables, which will make a new request to the back end. Questions so far? There's a lot of speculation that context might be going away in the future. The Facebook team has talked about it, but they're not sure yet, so I don't think they've announced anything. But I think that there's a lot of libraries that could use context that are avoiding it for that reason. Produced officially like a few months ago? Yeah. Oh, I could be mistaken and that they are going to be moving uh, towards it. OK. In uh, version 2.4 of React Router, they said, we're not officially deprecating router or this dot context dot router, but it sounds like it could happen in the future. So instead, you should inject it through a higher order component. So that's what I'm basing my knowledge off of. But it's quite possible that context is going to be the future. So that's a good question. I would 
Um, no, it's not. And so we'll take a look at how it gets injected in one second. Real quick, so the request we made on the back end was we had get me the first 10 feeds, and then I said get me the next 10, the, ne the first 20 feeds after that, and take a look at the query that actually got ran by Relay behind the scenes. Is it said actually get me the first 10 after cursor. So this is where they implement that cursor spec uh, under the hood. And it's not something that you have a lot of control over, so just be aware of that. But actually, this is a really cool optimization if you are using the cursor spec, is that it knew that you had the first 10 records that you wanted. So now it's just saying, just get me the last set of records. And similarly, if you're requesting part of an object and then you need another part of an object down the road through a mutation, it'll just say, get that, those few fields from that object. And still, your database layer can overfetch, but at least GraphQL won't return those extra objects that you don't need anymore. Is that real right there, that query with the dot, dot, dot? Yes. So this is saying, on the root query, give me the fragment of F0. And I want all feeds that are going to have this cursor and the first 10 after this cursor. And then give me all the records. And for each record, give me the row ID and name. So this is actually something that happened under the hood with Relay. They look really complex. There's some way to see. You just said it's under the hood. There's some way to see what it does? Just, yeah, the network tab. We'll make post requests to the GraphQL endpoint. So the question was, how do you see these queries that are happening under the hood? And you can see it through the network request. Network tab, sorry. OK. So. We saw the initialize variables uh, helper function where we can set some initial variables. But what if we want to get those variables from props.params or props.query? With React Router, you, React Router Relay, you can still do that through a prepare, prepare, params function. So you can have access to props.params and props.query. It was something that I got stuck on early on because I know like here's a feed ID of five in the URL. So how do I get access to that? And that's how you would do it. Another way you could do it is just calling set variables. So on component will mount, I say, I know here's the feed ID from this.props.params.feedid. And so I just pass that back. And that's the first time it'll make that request. Transforming variables. So let's say I get a user's first name and I want to make that lowercase. You can call a prepare variables function inside your fragment or right above your fragment. And that'll allow you to do any data manipulation you need to do before you send the request to the back end. And the last piece of the spec, mutations. So the spec requires each mutation to send a client mutation ID in addition to the mutated object. So what that means is if you're sending a lot of mutations at once and you're just bulk inserting a bunch of records, it wants to have an, a unique ID for each of those so that when it gets the response back from the database, it can say, OK, for this unique ID, we're going to put this right here on the page. And for this unique ID, we're going to put that there on the page. We're going to look at a relay mutation first, and then what we need to do with GraphQL on the back end to get it inserted. So we're going to create our note mutation, which extends relay.mutation. And we're going to fetch here the mutation that is specified in the GraphQL endpoint. So just like we have our GraphQL objects and lists that are specified, you also specify all the mutations available to the user. We haven't built that create note mutation in GraphQL yet, but that's how you're going to specify it. And then you have get variables. So this is the payload that you're going to be passing in from the user when they make this request. And it's available on this.props. And that feels a little bit weird instead of just like grabbing it from the params. You have something you need to define in your relay mutation called get fat query. And this is what we need back from the server when we get the output from that mutation. So we might not have everything we need from the output of that mutation, and we would specify it here. Let me give you an example. So I've got a note that I am saving to the database, and I've never left a note on this page before. So if I want the note to have my user object to say, Jason wrote this note, it's going to need to pull that back from the database after the mutation happens. And that's what you would specify in a fact query. Questions with that? Next is mutation configs. And this is a little bit where Relay lost me. So <laughs> you've got different types of mutations, and you need to specify a whole bunch of config params to make it work correctly. So if I want to create, create a create mutation, I would use the range add type. And then what is the parent of this? It's a feed. 
What is the parent ID? So I need to give it the feed's global ID, that base64 encoded string. What is the connection name? So this is strange to me right here, is it's asking for connection name and edge name, and I'll tell you why it does that in a second, but I feel like your front-end developers shouldn't need to know about this. They ju should just need to know, I want to insert a note or an audit log or a user. And then the last part is range behaviors, and you can say, I want to append this to my list of notes or I want to prepend it. And you can also inject a whole bunch of logic in there about if you get back X, then do this with it, otherwise do Y. Here are some of the other mutation config types, so you're aware of them. There's field change. I want to update some variables that are on that record. Node delete. So I want to remove the node from the connection on the back end and delete the record from the relay store on the front end. Range add. Add a node to the store and then save a record. Range delete. Remove a node from the back end, but keep it on the front end. And require children. Fetch fields on an object created by a mutation that haven't been fetched by your component fragment. An example of this is if I create a new feed on a create feed page, I won't have a list of all my feeds yet, so this will say you can get that list of feeds so that it's available for the user. And then there's optimistic response, which is the last part of the mutation um, that you're creating in Relay on the front end. And this says, for all of the fields that I have access to, display them to the user immediately. And if I don't have access to any of the fields, you can do what you want. So you can specify loading dot, 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 because I don't have the user yet for who inserted this note. But I do have this.props.note. It was passed to my payload, so I can show that immediately. And what happens with optimistic response is it'll show it on, in that collection immediately on the React component. And then if it, gets, uh, if it fails to insert for whatever reason, then it will strip it from that collection and just like pull it away. And it also will give an error that you can handle in some way. Lastly, we have the user's payload, so we need to commit the update. So we call relay.store.commitUpdate with whatever the mutation is that we just created and the payload. And on the back end, we've got the GraphQL mutation that we need to specify. So we need to know what the input is, what the output is, and what we need to do with the data to save it to the database. And this is going to be adhering to the relay spec. So if it looks really strange, Mutations from GraphQL are not necessarily this complicated, but with Relay, they are. So you've got your input fields, and this is pretty straightforward, except that you also need to specify that parent. So if I'm leaving a note on feed 5, then I need to specify a parent with a global ID of whatever that base64 encoded string is. Output fields is where it gets weird, though. So I need to output that feed with that ID of a global ID, and then I need to output the note edge. So not only do I need to output the note that just got saved to the database, but also the metadata associated with it, that cursor. And I also need to know what the edge type is here. So I need to say that this is a note edge specifically. And in mutate and get payload, this is where you have your promise that saves the record to the database. Whatever gets returned, so note here is my bookshelf model. I'm passing in the payload of ID and note and user. And then I get back the note that was saved to the database. And then here I return the object with the client mutation ID, which I had to strip out of my payload, but it's in there. It's not part of my database, but Relay needs it, so I need to strip it out with Lodash's omit function. I need to return that feed, which is the parent. And I need to return the note that I'm using two JSON here because there's helper functions inside Bookshelf, but you might need, not need to do that necessarily. So you're returning a whole bunch of information on top of the object that was saved. And lastly, in schema.js, we need to add the root mutation type. So previously we were saying, here's all the data the user can get, and, here, and now we're saying, here are all the mutations the user can perform. And Behind, under the hood, this is what a relay mutation looks like. So below, I've got my variables. I've got my payload here, which is going to be everything that gets returned if it's successful. And I've got a create note mutation, which is going to take the input, which is the payload from the user. And the client mutation ID is going to be returned along with the spread operator for that payload, so everything inside that payload, essentially. Questions? So 
GraphQL, um, like in its true form or normal usage, only used on the back end, or and then this relay is used in the front end. Is is that a typical use case, or the question is? What is the relationship between GraphQL and Relay, and which one is front end and back end, and are they reversible? So GraphQL is always going to be defined on the back end, and Relay can be defined on the front end, but there's probably other implementations out there that can interface with GraphQL that are going to make it easier. And alternatively, with GraphQL, this is just one endpoint on your web server that you can make a post request to with the simple queries that we looked at earlier. So that's another alternative for you if you don't want to implement this Relay spec. So there's a lot of different options for you. But then you lose the connection to the React component and then any possible caching. Correct. Um, the question was, do you lose the connection to the React component and the caching benefits that you get from Relay? And you would lose that if you don't have some other implementation that supports that. So post-mortem, these were some customizations I needed to make there's the node definitions. So I needed to get access to that global ID base 64 encoded string from my record because I didn't want to say like if record dot has property type of username, then it's a person. I wanted to be able to know this is the global ID I used to fetch the record. And from that global ID, I can get my GraphQL object type. I needed to change my cursor so it didn't use the array index, but instead it used ID so that I could easily paginate through things with some accuracy until our users start sorting, in which case it's going to break. And connections from array. So this is where I was saying inside pagination, I only want to overfetch one record. So if I request the first 10, I actually just get 11 instead of 100,000. And that helps me populate has next page. So these were some customizations I needed to make for it to work with my organization. There's also some niceties about it. So we talked earlier about the single initial data request to the back end. And that's pretty awesome. And all of this is actually lightning fast. I can request a lot of records, and it comes back very fast. On top of that, there's a nice user experience, because you don't have all these loading indicators all over your React app for each component that's loading data separately. You load it once, and then you get back all the data that you need. So you have one loading indicator. It's great for infinite scroll if you're implementing that. Uh, our company is not. We really prefer that back and forward button. And it does the automatic optimizations when you're fetching records. So we saw we requested first 10 and then first 20. And it automatically said, give me the first 10 after this cursor. Um, but really, I think the biggest benefits here are that it's awesome for your front end developers to have flexibility instead of being pigeonholed into what your REST routes offer. And even more than that, they can see the capabilities of your GraphQL server by using GraphEQL. And they can get the query that they need without having to dig through routes and understand how promises work. So you might have a front-end developer who's never touched Node or Python or PHP before. And they can just look at GraphEQL, auto-complete the query they need, and then they're good to go. They're not blocked. They can continue with their work. And that's pretty awesome. So here's some considerations before you implement either GraphQL or GraphQL with the Relay spec is if you're using a lot of JSON fields or you have NoSQL schemas that aren't defined, that could be an issue for you. You have Relay's global ID, which will be fixed sometime in the future. You've got the connection spec with the fetch all and handling cursors. Unidirectional pagination. Uh, I found the mutations to be very verbose, so maybe that's an issue for your front end developers, because then they need to start understanding how connections and edges work. and then. There's probably going to be breaking changes for the version 1 release of Relay, because I think that there's probably a lot of cleanup that's going to happen with it. And you're going to probably have to do some sort of refactor at that point. That's just a guess or assumption on my part. So what is CK going to do with all the information that we learned from this? I think that what we'll probably do is implement the original GraphQL spec that we did before we started using Relay. And then we're going to just handle something that's going to aggregate all of our queries on the front end. I'm not sure how we're going to do that yet, but maybe we'll just build something. And then we'll just make those GraphQL queries. We'll use limit and offset as we were with bookshelf models before. And we get the benefit of using GraphEQL so the developers still have that flexibility. They can still see all the queries that are getting auto-completed, but without all of the complexities of that relay spec that we were just talking about. I also wanted to post some resources for the research that I did to build this presentation. 
if you haven't heard about like the Awesome series, it's basically just a list on GitHub of a bunch of, I guess, resources that are available for you uh, that you can look through. And that has probably like 100 records on it. Post GraphQL is really awesome. So if you use Postgres, you can just say, here's my Postgres data connection. And it introspects the query for GraphQL and builds your, post -graph, sorry, your GraphQL interface automatically. The downside to that is your user is going to have access to like, all of your tables and fields. So maybe you don't want that. But it was actually a really great learning resource for me. There's the Relay Starter Kit. And that's going to be using like, some sample JSON data. But you at least get to see on the front end how you can build Relay fragments. Um, and then I also used GraphQL Newsfeed. There was the Star Wars API through GraphQL. And that was the first time I didn't see JSON data. I saw API requests built into the, Graphi the GraphQL system. So it would make an API request to fetch the data back for the user, which was really neat. There's Graffiti, which is a plugin to uh, kind of build the schema for you. And it only supports Mongoose right now. Um, there's some GraphQL validation and common errors that you can learn about. And there's Relay 101. And that was also really good info for me with the Babel Relay plugin. So I know that that was super data intense. I hope that you guys learned a lot. And I know that there's going to be a lot of questions. So don't feel like you have to ask me the question right now. And if you're a viewer that's watching online, then definitely ask questions online on whatever channel you're watching on. And we'd be happy to answer those for you. So let's take questions now if we have any. Yes, sir. So uh, I just had two. They're pretty simple. Um, the GraphQL ID, uh, that scalar, what is, can you pick what that's backed by, or is it always backed by an int? It's just that it's unique. A string is a scalar ID string. For your if it, IDs. OK. My global ID. So well, you, not for global ID, for the GraphQL ID, when you introduce the object types and scalar types. Yeah, so the, the question is for the GraphQL type of ID, is it, does it always have to be an integer? I actually don't know the answer to that question. We've always used uh, integers as our primary keys, so I can't answer that one for you. You do have strings for your ID field? OK. Yeah, a scalar, like there's multiple types to satisfy a scalar. Perfect. Okay. So, so that's just something that needs to be unique. Gotcha. Right? And OK. The other one um, was the code that you were showing us earlier, all those functions getting everything set up, you know, on the, before you got to Relay. Um, is that somewhere, or is that your boilerplate, and then you have to kind of have to adapt it for a project, or story there? Yeah, so the question is, where is the code uh, that's in these slides? Is it anywhere that's available to all of the developers? And we've got our Node Happy Skeleton, which is a backend web server that uses Happy. And what we're going to do with that is create the GraphQL implementation before we used the Relay spec. And then we're just going to push that branch up and then merge it into master. So everybody's going to have access to it. It also uses Docker, so you can create a sample Postgres database locally. And it'll have some migration, so you can insert some sample records. It'll also have GraphEQL, so you'll be able to start playing with that user interface and seeing how GraphQL works. So we should have that up shortly. And when we do, the Phoenix ReactJS meetup can post a link about that. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Is that code you wrote that's resolving the, the GraphQL queries into the, like, the or, like building the actual queries to the ORM and like, collecting that data and returning it? Or is that something that's like, what's called, like, already existing? So the question is, with the code that I put on screen, what happens with the queries in the back end? So in the first, yeah, very good question. So in the first few slides, I was just using connects, and you could see select star from notes and then I was getting the ID and the note back. So you can, Connex is a SQL query builder. So it's just a connection to my database. And I was just passing raw queries straight into it. And so whenever you get a, you define the fields that are, the user is allowed to get back from GraphQL. You define the arguments that they're allowed to filter on, like an ID, for instance. <coughs> and then you have a resolve function. So you can do whatever you want in that resolve function to get the records back to them. You can look at what fields they requested. You can look at the arguments that were passed in. 
and you can use whatever query language tool that you have to get the results back to them. And as a matter of fact, you're just returning a promise there, so it doesn't even need to be coming back from a database. So a really good example to learn more about that is the Star Wars API. They've got a JSON API that they're just making post requests to based on the filters that the user is specifying with GraphQL, and then they get the response back. Very good question. It's just whatever you want to return from the promise based on the fields, the filters, and... Yep. Yes, sir. There's, the question was, how does GraphQL interface with NoSQL databases? And in the resources section, there's a few different um, resources for implementing with Mongoose, for instance. But you are going to need to define what your schema is, and it needs to be very statically typed. So you need to know in your NoSQL that this is a collection that I'm going to get back, and it's going to have these records that are going to have these fields. And so an example that I talked about earlier is the exception report collection. And I have a metadata field that in Postgres is JSONB, but it's basically a big object. And I actually don't know what the keys are. The developers can decide like when they're writing exception reports, this is what data is going to be needed to debug that issue that happened on the server down the road. And we don't have that standardized at all. So that's not something I'm going to have access to unless I look at every unique key inside that object and map it out in the GraphQL type. That's a really good question. It was about security, and will you shoot yourself in the foot if you open up GraphQL to the users? Luckily for our company, we have internal clients that are going to be using these applications, so it's not as much of a concern. With our GraphQL endpoint, you can specify whatever headers you want. So we can still pass in a JWT or a JSON web token that will say, is this user <coughs> authenticated, and are they one of our users? And if they aren't, throw a 401 unauthorized. If they are, just let them do what they want with GraphQL. And so you still pass your queries into GraphQL from separate REST endpoints, you said? So um, by the way, log, logging in and logging off and all that authentication stuff, that's not part of GraphQL. I mm -hmm. have REST endpoints for uh, authenticating. Okay. But once I'm authenticated, you still have to hit one endpoint in mm -hmm. order to actually get your GraphQL response. So at that endpoint, I have all the information I need to know whether or not they have that role or whether or not they're authenticated. So I can just pass that into the GraphQL constructor in my C sharp. So I have full access to that from the root query. I just pass it in when I'm constructing it. And then I can just reject. So basically, I pass it as an argument from the top level down as far as I need to reject any field I need to. Great. So having some sort of middleware that can take care of the authorization portion of it. Yeah, so the, well, the short answer is you still have to hit one REST endpoint mm -hmm. to get your response, and you can do all your authentication from that REST endpoint. So you lost two, I think. Uh, so off two, I think. Yeah, so you, any other service? yeah, you have one endpoint just like you always do. Yeah. So and you can have all this stuff at that endpoint. JWT, right? JWT, yeah, yeah. 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 So you pass that along to your GraphQL like your service? I'm not familiar with it, but I'm almost 100% have full access to everything you normally have. You just have to pass it in and reconstruct the object from 
Yeah, so I believe uh, Auth0 is JWT doesn't heal deal with authorization right now, it just deals with authentication. So it'll say, here's the user that requested this, and we know that this is the user that's logged in. So you would still need to handle, if they're doing a mutation on the user's table, are they allowed to do that? And you'll need some sort of middleware for that. Yes, sir? One of the selling points I've heard for GraphQL is that um, once you kind of define your schema, um, as you have need, need to change the UI, you don't have to change uh, much backend code really at all. Um, have you found that to be true in practice, or do you find that you have to uh, make a lot of backend changes as, as the need for um, like different pieces of the UI? Yeah, so the question was, as you're changing your collections, do you need to make a lot of backend changes to adhere to those new collection changes? And the answer to that is not really. So you have to define any new fields you have or remove any fields that you don't have. If you make any changes to the way that your inserts, updates, or deletes work, then you're going to need to change those. But you're probably going to be doing that from some sort of REST endpoint anyway. And I think that this just creates a lot more flexibility and it gives you, as a backend developer, less places that you need to look for where that's happening at. Does that help answer your question? I find that the schema is changing a lot because um, kind of some of the presentations basically is they kind of talk about how they have one schema that defines everything. And that for, for a UI developer, they just need to figure out what part of that schema they need to request data. And that it doesn't change very often. Um, so do you find that the schema is changing a lot? Or uh, as you uh, develop, not, not so much adding new stuff, that, that makes sense, but as there's just different needs come up. Yeah, so the question is how often does the schema JS or the schema JSON file change? And I think that's really going to depend on your backend application and if it's at like a stable V1 release or if you're doing a lot of active development. So anytime we make a database migration, then we're probably going to need to update schema.json. But it's pretty easy to do. You can just do it on the fly with an update schema that writes to the file system saying, hey, use that introspection query that you were previously using and create the new schema for us.